Thanks so much for having me. And uh, again, I'm Monica Rodisco Gutierrez. I'm a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician. And that's where it's kind of tough about, you know, it's a physio, is it a physiatrist, a physiatrist? It's definitely not a psychiatrist. Um, I was on a meeting this morning with someone from uh, Australia and he said they're called rehabilitation medicine physicians. So I think we need to define ourselves a, a, a little bit better, but basically a physician that cares a lot about function and how people do and their quality of life and look at patients really holistically. And so that is part of my practice. Um, I subspecialize in brain injury and stroke and spasticity. And then when COVID happened, saw a big need with patients who looked very much like patients who had brain injuries and strokes, and some of them were having strokes as well. And so really also started to take care of that population and saw the need that was there. And I'm here in San Antonio, Texas. It is, it's not Taco Tuesday, it's Wednesday though, but we like tacos on any day. <laughs> I, it's interesting that you you brought up the, uh, the the work in the brain that you've done because someone a, a viewer uh, sent in a question actually just before the show started. She said, um, "Does having a brain injury influence someone's long term recovery from COVID?" So, having one at baseline does it influence? It may influence them. They may already have had deficits when it came to having their brain injury. They may have already had you know, headaches or cognitive processing issues. Patients with brain injuries are at risk for certain things later in their life, including um, dementia, cardiovascular issues, and seizures. And so these are also risks that they're saying that people have from COVID as well. So it could be, you know, an extra risk factor, though it's not been fully studied. I know when we first talked to this this idea of long COVID, I, and I don't know the actual number, I'm guessing you do, of the number of people who've had COVID, let's just say just in the United States. What is, what is that number ballpark? I think if we're going to be conservative, we're going to say 10 million people. Wow. Because if we look at, you know, there is a paper that came out in JAMA last week that is from the RECOVER trial. Now, I was one of the consortium authors on that paper as well, because our a uh, university is one of the sites of the recover trial and they took in patients and this was from around omicron just people who had covid came in to the study um, acutely so they were enrolled in the study within 30 days so they don't know from that those 30 days who's going to get long covid who's not going to get long covid and in that group of all comers it was 10% so let's just say, let's be conservative and say 10%. And this was post-Omicron. If you look at the pre-Omicron, the number could have been higher as well. And if we think there's been over 100 million people in the US who've had COVID-19 as an infection, then it could be 10 million people living with COVID, long COVID. Right. And it was explained to me once and only because I'm not a doctor and I'm I'm just a civilian, so I'd understand, but they said that it's an inflammatory disease and that um, that means it will go after an area of your body where you are prone to have inflammation. So it may affect everybody differently. Is that correct? I mean, it's probably very high level, but is that mostly correct? I mean, I think that's what we're seeing and that's what we still need to do more research and find data on. But because that ACE2 receptor is in so many different parts of the body, is it right. going to, we know it, it affects your vasculature so it can get anywhere in the body. We know it can go to, you know, liver, lungs, heart. I mean, it isn't even just one area. It can kind of be anywhere in the body and they're finding even long um, persistence of the virus in people who have long COVID, even in the GI tract. And it's just kind of antigens of the virus are, are being found there, so. So you can, you can test positive long after you're asymptomatic, is that correct? So it doesn't mean that they would test positive even after being okay. asymptomatic. It would just be, it's, you know, a piece of the virus still in your body, but you may not, be testing positive because you know if they're testing your nose it may not be living there anymore it could be living oh. somewhere or anywhere else 
So how do you, okay, so how do you study it, Doc? So that's what we're still trying to learn with research is, you know, where is it? Where is it living? Is it in cells? Is it in, you know, what can we do about it? Um, I think that that's where the multi-billion dollar question is, and we need to continue to put funding into this research so we can really find out where is it? Where is it impacting mm. our bodies? What is still impacting our bodies? How is it impacting our immune systems? How come it's only 10% of people and not 75% of people? Yeah. Is the fact that it's not in the news, wall-to-wall -wall news now, um, is that hindering your work? So I would say, yes, people are tired. It's not in the news all the time. The pandemic's over. I never saw so many happy, you know, Facebook posts, even though it's like, is it really over? There's still a thousand people that die every week. People are still getting COVID and getting very symptomatic. People are still developing long COVID, even with these new variants. Very few percentage of people in the U.S. got boosters. And so it's just something that's going to be around for a very long time. And because it's not top of mind and people want are tired of it, want to get over it, it really is hard to try to convince that, hey, we still need to look at this. We still need to research this, we, you know, taking it to Congress, taking it to, um, to advocate for what still really needs to be done. Does the work then fall on private and state universities to do the research like you're doing and and we less reliance on the fed for this work you know but all research needs to be funded from somewhere oh yeah like, fair uh, enough whether it be uh grants and local grants or community grants or you know really rich tech people grants please put some more money into long covid as well as federal um so that support needs to come from all around to be done to continue to further this research. So one of the other challenges I've read about is the what you're dealing with in the post-COVID recovery clinics in terms of rehabilitating patients. Give, it, give us a, a sense of what that is like. I think one thing about clinics is that it's best, because I just said, COVID and long COVID affects so many body systems and so many different parts of our bodies. And it's different for everyone else, for everyone, what type of phenotype they have. Mm. Uh, in the study that came out, it was like four different main phenotypes. And one major one was smell and taste. Well, that may not be really debilitating, but then the next one, the patients had dizziness and palpitations and post-exertional malaise. And then there was a different, you know, there's different groups all with having the post-exertional malaise and the fatigue, and then some having one of the groups had kind of almost all the different symptoms that you could have with long COVID. And across, you know, all of these types of phenotypes are what a patient with long COVID looks like. So again, they can look very many things from something just more, you know, smell and taste to having all the symptoms related to long COVID. And then with that, we also, so we have to figure out like, okay, what are we going to research? What are we going to look at for each of these things? And in a long COVID clinic, if someone has every, all of the, you know, 12 types of symptoms, how can we address each of those things in a small period of time? And some of the things need um, multiple specialists to be working together. So if I see, you know, someone I can think that I saw recently, and it was like, well, she has a neurologist issue. She has a rheumatologist for rheumatological disease that developed. She has POTS. She has, um, yes, the fatigue. She has chronic migraine. She has a asthma. And so there's about six specialists that are involved. And sometimes really hard to get all those specialists in the room to see a patient at the same time. So we're trying to, you know, asynchronously take care of these patients but we can't just live in silos. We have to all talk because it's and make it patient centered. So that's one of the challenges um, that people who are taking care of patients with long COVID is a lot of times people just live in the silo of what they sure. specialize in, but we have to make it that, you know, 
that we're able to talk to each other for the betterment of the patient. Is this the first time that we've been challenged this way? I mean, you bring up a, a unique issue. I'm thinking it's hard enough getting a doc, but to get six in a patient's room at the same time, or even if you were to convene over their chart, you know, somehow, um, is are there other give us an is there another example of of where healthcare has been stressed in that way? Um, there's probably multiple examples of you know some places have had pediatrics does it really well in pediatric hospitals they'll sometimes come together and do multidisciplinary clinics for you know maybe children with special needs that you know need a neurologist and a physical mm -hmm. medicine and rehab specialist and a physical therapist and they'll come together but a lot of these specialty kind of multidisciplinary clinics they have to you have to have external support to have that much you know brain power at once working on a patient to be able to take care of their needs um otherwise it's kind of hard to get everyone there in that room and spend so much time on a patient. So we've seen it that sometimes, you know, HIV AIDS, there was a lot of funding that came into um, for HIV AIDS patients and to be able to take care of them holistically and, and put a lot of research behind that and have specialty clinics for them. But there is also um, for years and years on the other end of the spectrum, patients who have lots of needs and have not gotten that type of attention, mm -hmm. like ME-CFS, um, pot patients with POTS and dysautonomia, where we know it's a cardiac issue, it's a brain issue, it's a function issue, it's you know so many different things. So on one hand, we're talking about research so we can understand this, so we can find solutions uh, for the wider medical community. At the same time, we have people who have this right now that you just have to deal with. And when we talked earlier about the fatigue, I'm just thinking of civilian fatigue of listening and masks and all that stuff. I've got to guess the healthcare system itself is, is fatigued and stressed. And, and this is going away. Maybe the emergency-ness of it has gone away. But the the impact and the load on the system has not gone away. Could you speak to that for a second? Yeah, so I definitely agree that yeah, maybe the emergency of it, the life and death of it is not gone away, but there's still it's still a stress to our medical system. There are still people who are getting sick all the time, who are needing services, needing to go into hospitals, emergency rooms. And so it's still a stress to the system. Then a lot of patients that have long COVID, a lot of them are were before previously healthy and had no risk factors. And they may be, you know, for the most part, a lot of the studies showed the 40 year old women, a lot of um, that population that otherwise was healthy, they were not big utilizers of healthcare before. Right. And so now they're having to go to the doctor with increased frequency. And we're already, you know, very you know, busting at the seams and not having enough physicians and health workforce to meet the demand that was there. And now the demand's even higher. I'm, I'm just curious because in, in another universe, I'm working with people who are, are looking at the healthcare system and at writ large and, and trying to help with Paul, just having some outside voices on innovation and policy and what are all the different stressors involved and I knew I was going to have this conversation. So I was just curious, do you, is it getting the attention at, the, there you go, is it getting the attention at the board level? Because there's the business of healthcare meets the, the research and the doctoring and the patient care and all of those things. And as you said earlier, it's, it's all very, very expensive. And we're at a time where money, we've got lots of money issues. So I don't want to think that money issues impact healthcare, but I've I've got to imagine that it is, especially on the research side. No margin, no mission, right? So I said like you have to make some money to be able to do the research and to have mm. the mission of taking care of all patients, no matter their background. And so that means we do have to care that a bottom line is met, that we're able to, you know, get paid 
appropriately for taking care of the patients that we pay for and for the time that we put into that. You had mentioned a number earlier, you said 100 million, which made me, I think in the early days, I was tracking the John Hopkins numbers every day. I probably wasn't the only one doing that as those numbers were going up. Um, at 100 million, have we reached herd um, uh, what's the, the words herd now? Immunity. Yeah, herd immunity. Thank you. Yeah. So the answer is no, we're probably not really going to ever have a real good herd immunity because the antibodies drop so much. So even when you've had natural infection, yeah. you're, a lot of times those antibodies start going down. So the, which makes me think, stay on top of your booster shots. Stay on, right. There's going to be a point where it's going to be like the flu where they're going to have to kind of, you know, we get a yearly in the healthcare setting, we get our yearly flu vaccine. They kind of try to guess what are going to be the variants of the flu right. and put that in the vaccine. And we're probably going to have to do that um, for COVID as well. So is there something that the, the broader, is there some awareness that if the broader community understood more of what these challenges were, we could be more helpful to you? Um, I think so. I think, you know, as a community, we still have to think about each other and think about that there are people who are really at risk of getting very mm. sick still with long COVID, people who are immunocompromised, or with COVID period, and then even right. with long COVID, you know, people who are immunocompromised, people who are on dialysis, people who um, are older, you know, they're still at risk of getting very severe COVID and dying. And so we still, you know, those, you've heard stories of people almost leaving society because society is, you know, is not wearing masks and not so much caring about going out when they're sick and not getting vaccinated. And so um, it's, it's tough for that part of society who is really at risk and wants to protect themselves. And we need to think a little bit more about them. I sure appreciate you helping us understand these issues. It's going to go on for several years. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.